Well, let's take the Word of God this evening, and if you please turn with me to the book of Colossians and chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I uh, <clears throat> trust that uh, the series has been a help and a challenge to all of us. And as I mentioned, I know we are going through a series on God's design for marriage, but uh, the truths, as we find them in the scriptures, are really applicable to uh, many aspects and many relationships. Uh, and that's the wonderful thing about the truth of God. It is truth, and it is helpful to us. And it beats uh, any uh, you know, psychology book out there or any uh, doctor's counsel when dealing with uh, issues that uh, are common to men. Uh, and uh, we're grateful that God has uh, those answers in His Word. We're going to begin in just a moment reading in Colossians chapter 3. We'll read verse, uh, two verses in verse 12 and 13. But uh, I have valued the counsel of my father over the years, and there is one piece of advice that I remember being given that has been the most helpful. Uh, there are certainly many helpful truths that can be shared to help uh, marriage relationships. But here is what my father encouraged me to do. He said, son, ask for forgiveness when you are wrong and learn to forgive. Now we come to the last sermon in the series, God's Design for Marriage, and much has been said along the way, and certainly much more could be said with regard to this important topic, and I trust that we will come away uh, from this series being sober-minded about the marriage relationship. Um, the marriage relationship can be the greatest of all of human relationships. On the other hand, the marriage relationship can be one of the most painful of all human relationships. God intends for our marriages to be wonderful, to be filled with joy, and furthermore, God has ordained this relationship the marriage relationship, to be the greatest influence upon the lives of our children. Uh, I close this series with one of the most important truths to be applied to the marriage relationship. And the title of the message this evening is this, The Ministry of Forgiveness. I've encouraged us as we looked at this series and looked at the Word of God to have a mindset when it comes to the marriage relationship, to have a mindset of ministry. Uh, that God, when He brings a man and a woman together for life, that He intends both of them to carry on a ministry towards each other. And we looked at Ephesians chapter 5, the ministry that is assigned to the wife, and we also looked at the ministry that is assigned to the husband. I was reading from the book by Jim Binney. He wrote on the book, The Ministry of Marriage, and he, he wrote this about the marriage relationship, he said, probably no other relationship is as rife with potential for anger as is marriage. It is the only human relationship in which a man and woman are thrown together for a lifetime in such transparent proximity. This does not allow hiding any weaknesses or impressing one another like one can a stranger. There is no secret. Marriage exposes both partners to the pressures of stressful moments. It is fertile soil for emotional differences and a culture dish to breed the germs of anger and unforgiveness. Why? Because again, it is the closest re human relationship there is. We can think about many instances, whether it is the conflict that arises because of one event or one thing that was done in the marriage, or it could be even a series of offenses that have happened over a long period of time. You think about, perhaps in the extreme, the unfaithfulness of a husband or a wife. Now I say the extreme, I am very aware that that's very common in our world. But a broken-hearted wife sat across her pastor and his wife after her husband had been unfaithful. She looked at the pastor with tears in her eyes and with a sincere question. Pastor, how can I forgive him? 
In the same manner, a husband was in distress after he learned that his wife of 15 years had been unfaithful with someone she had met online. He said this, How could she do this to me and to our five children? I don't think I could ever forgive her. We can also think about repeated offenses. Whether it is the continual nagging of a wife or the continued angry outbursts of a husband. A husband married for five years came to his pastor in frustration. He explained by naming many examples how he had been nagged by his wife. And in his deep frustration he said, She treats me like a child. She's been acting like my mother ever since we've been married. I've been so angry at her and the more she keeps doing it, the more angry I seem to become. Before the pastor could respond, he emphatically declared, If she keeps doing this, I don't think that I will ever be able to forgive her. A wife married for seven years looked like she was carrying the weight of the world on her shoulders. She spoke to her pastor's wife about what she had been dealing with. She hesitatingly began sharing what was on her mind concerning her husband. She said, he keeps getting so angry at every little thing I do wrong. He yells and screams at me all the time. I just can't stand it anymore. I know the Bible says that I am supposed to forgive him, but how can I forgive him? I don't feel loved anymore. Now I bring our attention to the scriptures. Therein are the answers to such deep issues that are common to mankind. I understand that there are extreme issues and that there are issues that may be repeated over time or sometimes something so small, but often there may be small little offenses that can bring about a great devastation and a great hindrance to the prosperity of a relationship. You see, the subject that I'm going to talk about today is not a popular one. We are encouraged often, and I'm talking about in the world, we are encouraged to render evil for evil. Isn't that the truth? Someone does something to you, you get them back. But the message of forgiveness is a distinctly Christian message. We like such messages as it pertains to us receiving forgiveness. The forgiveness of Jesus Christ. But we do not like the message of forgiveness as it pertains to exercising forgiveness towards others. It's a little harder. It's always easier to receive forgiveness, to ask for forgiveness, than it is for us to give forgiveness. If you notice with me in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13, the Bible says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, who is that talking to? Believers. The elect of God, God's people. Holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and here it is, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. If you turn with me just a few pages to your left to the book of Ephesians in chapter 4, we read this passage last week, but Ephesians chapter 4, notice with me verse 31 and 32. In the same manner here, among, along the same line, the Bible says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Verse 32 of Ephesians 4, And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, here it is, forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. I want you to know that in both of these passages there's something in common. I know we read that we are to forgive one another but what I'm more interested in here is that Colossians 3.13 says that we are to forgive as Christ forgave you. That's what he said. Again in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 he says to the believers forgiving one another as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. 
And so here we have, in the midst of the subject of forgiveness, our Lord Jesus Christ stands as our example in all things. We see that Christ, for example, in John chapter 13, verse 14, is our example for humble service. He washed the disciples' feet and he says, I've given you example that you should do as I have done unto you. And so Jesus Christ put himself as the standard of humble service and he says to the disciples, I want you to do just as I have done unto you. We see that Christ also has demonstrated a pattern to follow in personal holiness in 1 Peter 1.15. That we are to be holy because He is holy. We see also that Christ is our model for love according to Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2. The husband is to love his wife even as Christ loved the church. Now as far as forgiveness is concerned, Scripture is clear that Christ is also the model for forgiveness. We read that in Colossians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 4. Do this as Christ, as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Repeatedly, believers are instructed to forgive, combining with the instruction, the example of Christ himself, with the word as. This is not a new teaching that is only found in the New Testament epistles. Jesus Christ himself instructed his disciples in the same exact way. In Matthew 6, verse 12, when he taught his disciples how to pray, he says, when you pray, say this, and part of the prayer was this, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He would go on to say in verse 14 and 15, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. In Luke chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus is teaching and he says, But love ye your enemies. And sometimes in the marriage relationship, you might feel that your spouse is your enemy. Do good and lend, hoping to uh, for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. That's God. He is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, uh, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Mark eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus says, And when ye stand praying, forgive. If ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. And so, it is repeatedly stated that our forgiveness of others is directly connected to the forgiveness that has been extended to us and to the forgiveness that will be extended to us. Let's talk about forgiveness. What does forgiveness mean? I was reading the dictionary today, and here is the, the, the definition of forgiveness. It is the act of forgiving to pardon an offender by which he is considered and treated as not guilty. He goes on to say in the dictionary, it means the to pardon or to remit the remission of an offense or a crime. It is a disposition of pardon, a willingness to forgive. It is the a remission of debt, a fine, or a penalty. And as we see here that the command is for believers to forgive one another, we're applying this particularly to the relationship of the husband and the wife, that they are to forgive one another. I know that we might think, well, he's writing here to believers. I think that we all understand it applies to all relationships with regard to uh, the, the Christian life and that we need to learn to forgive. And where do we learn that best but from Christ himself? Turn with me to Colossians. If you were there in Colossians 3, go back to chapter 2 of the book of Colossians. Notice with me verse 13 and 14 of Colossians chapter 2. 
He says this, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now, that's Jesus Christ. That's what he did. He has forgiven us all trespasses. Isn't that what the Bible says? Verse 14. Here is the uh, a commentary on what that means. For Verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now I want us to think about that expression as he refers to the believers that the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. When this was written according to Roman law, if a man had committed crimes, these offenses committed were written on a document. That document would then be nailed to the door of the prison cell of the offender until the offender had served out his time and paid the necessary um, penalty based on the time done for all of the offenses that were listed there on the prison cell door. The laws of the ordinances uh, he had violated were there in plain sight for everyone to see. And since the document was in handwritten form, it was called the handwriting of ordinances against the guilty prisoner. When the prisoner had completed the sentence, the document was taken off the prison door. The magistrate, or in today's vocabulary, the judge, would write across it, it is finished. And he would return it to the prisoner as proof that he had paid his debt for violating the laws of society. If he were stopped and challenged on the street once he was free, he only needed to show the document as evidence that he had paid the debt and that therefore he had the right to live as a free man. Why? Because the handwriting of ordinances against him was crossed off with, it is finished. As we read in the Bible, the Bible says that Jesus Christ has forgiven you all trespasses. And the Bible says that what happened is that he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. And so think about what Jesus did in correlation to that word, forgiving us all trespasses. The Bible refers to those who are unbeliever to be, dead in, in, to be dead in their sins, to be slaves to sin. And so if you think about what Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross, if you think about a, a back to every single man that lived throughout the parade of human history, I want you to think from the very beginning all the way up till now, you see a parade of prison cell door, prison cell, prison cell, prison cell, prison cell, prison cell, prison cell and who stands in every one of those uh, prison cells is every single man and woman that's ever walked the face of this earth. And as you walk through the prison cells, you would see the handwriting of ordinances that would be against that prisoner, that person that's guilty there in the cell because of the crimes committed. And what Jesus Christ, uh, in effect, did when he died on the cross, he walks through the parade of human history, he walks by every cell, and he grabs the handwriting of ordinances against that man, and he goes over and walks to the next prison cell, and he grabs the handwriting of ordinances against him, and then he, he grabs the handwriting of ordinances against you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and, you, and then and he takes the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and he goes to the cross and he pays for the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. And that's why on the cross when he said, it is finished, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us was blotted out. It was taken out of the way. It was what? It was forgiven. The debt has been paid. It's forgiven. That's the example of Christ. When the Bible says to the believer, forgive as Christ, that's exactly what he did. He has forgiven us all trespasses. Now, Peter asked a question 
to the Lord Jesus Christ that prompted Jesus Christ to put forth a challenge on the issue of forgiveness. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Um, let's go down to verse 21, Matthew 18, verse 21. Give you a minute to get there, Matthew 18, verse 21. Notice what the Bible says. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now, before we proceed here, I think we all understand that the idea is Jesus Christ is not teaching Peter, keep track, until you reach the seventy times seven. That's not the point. <clears throat> the point is, you shouldn't be keeping track of the offense or the offenses against you. Now, that's very helpful for our marriages, is it not? Our marriages, when conflict come, should not be a constant reminder of ordinances that have been committed against each other throughout the entirety of the marriage relationship. But often, that's what things turn into. Well, two years ago, six months ago, Last week, and then, poof, conflict. Now, let's look at what Jesus said, verse 23. Therefore, is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him who owed him 10,000 talents. That's a lot. That would be probably equated about, and there's different estimates, probably about a million dollars in today's uh, currency, which back then would be for a servant to his king and to his lord would be impossible. Do we understand? that? That's the idea here of those 10,000 talents. To verse 25, but for as much as he had n not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Now this was pretty drastic, right? Uh, we're going to sell your wife and your children and this is a pretty serious thing. And so all he can do is he's got nothing and so he bows down, he worships and he, he asks for, for patience and mercy in verse 27, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and for, here's the word, forgave him the debt. Wow, he couldn't pay the debt and he's been forgiven that debt. This is significant. Why now he can keep his, his children and his wife and all those things. Verse 28, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him an hundred pence and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me that thou owest. Now remember, this is the man who's just been forgiven. Verse 29. And his fellow servant fell down on his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not. But went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw that he, what, what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to, be, to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not every man uh, everyone his brother, their trespasses. Now, an important word there that appears right at the end is this. If ye from your hearts forgive not. Now, th that's an important point. Because often we may move on and pretend that we're forgiven, but in our hearts we're still holding a grudge there. And the forgiveness has not happened in the heart. Now, 
I, I want us to think here about this account because Jesus, or remember the question is from Peter is, how many times am I going to forgive a brother that trespasses against me? Seven times? Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. So this is rather clear. Here's what this passage teaches. The greater sin is found in the one who refused to forgive after he himself had been forgiven. That's what this is all about right here. The debt represented with which the servant owed to his Lord would be the equivalent to an enormous debt that was impossible for him to pay. The estimated range was uh, as high as a million dollars in today's currency. And yet he turned around to find a fellow servant who owed him would be, a, would be about the equivalent of $15. And he did not forgive him. Now, I, I want us to think about, you remember what Jesus told his disciples in John 13, 16. He washed the disciples' feet and then he says, I've given you example that he should do as I have done unto you. And you remember what he said, he tells them this in John 13, 16. The servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Now, I want you to think about this. The servant is not greater than his Lord. In this account, we find the Lord forgives the servant. But the servant is unwilling to forgive the fellow servant. So do you see what the servant did? The servant considered himself greater than his Lord. Now, <clears throat> is it reasonable for anyone to say, thank you Jesus for being the sinless Lamb of God, who suffered for my sins and for the sins and the sinfulness of others, of all men. But Lord, don't ask me to do the same. Is that reasonable? Here are some principles that we learned from the account in Matthew 18. When you read, notice verse 22, as we begin here this account, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Here is the first principle we pull here from this teaching on forgiveness that Jesus Christ is teaching Peter. We learn here the emphasis, and this is important, let's bring that into our marriages. The emphasis here is on the need to forgive and not on the magnitude or the repetition of the offense. Do we catch that here? The emphasis is on the need to forgive over and over and over again and not to emphasize the magnitude or the repetition of the offense. But often, as human beings, that's what we do. We focus on the offenses. Well, that's been seven times. It's been 70 times seven. And we forget that God has given us a ministry of forgiveness. And so what needs to be emphasized is on the ministry that God has given us to forgive each other more than the magnitude or the repetition of the offense. That's what Jesus Christ here is first teaching. He's, that's what he's teaching Peter. He begins by saying that we like to focus on all the faults and all the failures into our mate instead of focusing on the need to forgive. Why do we expect perfection where perfection is not possible? God teaches us to forgive. Why? Because it's going to be needed. That's why. Because there's going to be offenses. Because there's going to be conflict. And so the Lord says, don't, don't focus on the conflict. Focus on the need to forgive. But remember that we are not ignorant of what it means to be forgiven. So we see the emphasis is on the need to forgive and not on the magnitude or the repetition of the offense. This is what typically happens 
If you have a conflict between a husband and wife and people get to the place where they're, they're so, uh, their, their, their relationship is in so, such a conflict that they come to a marriage counselor and they tell them, and, and what, what typically comes up is the offenses that each of them have done towards each other. Well, uh, she, Pastor, she is nagging me over and over again. She's treating me like a child. And well, uh, no, that was the reverse. Yes, the husband, wife nagging, and then the wife says, well, my husband, you know, he, he's not doing what he's supposed to do. And, and you go over the offenses and you focus on the offenses and the transgression. And Jesus Christ says, don't fo focus on the offenses or the amount of the offenses or the repetition of the offenses or the magnitude even of the offenses. You forgive. That's the emphasis. Now, the second thing we learn is this, is that the debt we owe is far greater than any debt we are owed. Do you understand that? The debt we owe, we owe, is far greater than any debt we are owed. Notice verse 24. When he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. So Jesus Christ here is teaching, and the emphasis here is going to be on this one servant who's not going to forgive, but the emphasis is look at the debt that he owes. I mean, it's, it's beyond anything he can handle. He cannot pay it. It's so bad that his wife and his children have to be sold and everything that he possesses have to be sold, and there's no way that he can uh, pay this debt. And yet we read in verse 28, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, which is not much. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And again, the focus is on this servant. And the, the point here that Jesus Christ is making here, when he tells Peter, uh, forgive 70 times 7, is this to Peter. Peter, the debt that you owe is far greater than anybody's debt that is owed to you. Well, how do we relate that to our lives? Well, I think we relate it this way, based on the truth of God's Word, that the debt that we owed Christ is far greater than any debt that is owed to us. The pain and the suffering that we've inflicted to our Lord is our far greater magnitude than what anybody can do to us. So, the debt we owe is far greater than any debt we are owed. Now, what I'm trying to do is, I'm tr we, have to, we have to get the right perspective. Because in our flesh, we get the wrong perspective. And we may begin to think about how wonderful we are, how great we are, and how people should not offend us because we do not have the right to be offended. And we forget that we've owed a debt that could not be paid. There's a third thing we find in here. And notice, um, let, let's go look at uh, verse 27. Um, the Bible says, Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But if you read down in verse 30, And he would not but went and cast him into prison, till he should pay his debt. So the Lord had compassion on the servant and forgave him the debt. That's verse 27. But then, verse 30, the servant did not forgive the other, the fellow servant, but he cast him into prison till he should pay his debt. So <clears throat> here's what we learn. The natural man always looks upon the offenses of another as being of greater degree than his own offenses. Let me say that again. The natural man always looks upon the offenses of another as being of greater degree than his own offenses. That's what happened. So the servant was shown compassion for the great debt that he owed. But then when a small debt was owed to him, the Bible is very descriptive. He grabbed the fellow servant by the throat and he cast him into prison 
for an insignificant amount. What does that tell us? That he forgot, right, the, the magnitude of what he owed, and what he saw is what was little owed over there was amplified, and the grade that he had over here was minimized. You see, that's how the natural man works. The natural man always looks upon the offenses of another, of another, as being greater degree than our own offenses. You know, throughout this series, I've said this repeatedly, that we always focus on, well, this is what she, my wife has done, this is what she's done, this is what has been done in her life, or the wife may say, well, this is what my husband does, and he always does this, and this is what, and the offenses in the other person is big, but my offenses are small. Do you know what a spiritual man does? The spiritual man who understand his own self, he magnified, magnifies his offenses and he minimizes the offenses of his partner. That's what the spiritual man does. We see that, by the way, all throughout the book of Proverbs. That the fool always takes something uh, that should be concealed, that should be secret, and he publishes it. Makes it greater than it is. And the things that need to be uh, you know, that are great, he needs to minimize it. That's, the, the, that's what the spiritual man does. But here we see that's exactly what the servant does. So the natural man always looks upon the offense of another as being of greater degree than his own offenses. There's another thing we notice in verse 35. The Bible says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your heart forgive not every man, everyone his brother their trespasses. Here's what we learn, is that there is no forgiveness for those who refuse to forgive others. You know what that means? That if in our walk and our relationship with the Lord, if we come and we there's a, an offense in our lives against God and we seek for God to forgive us, if we do not forget, forgive our brother, or in this case, our husbands or your wife, then what happens is that you're not going to be forgiven. Why? Because the Bible tells us God will not forgive us if we do not forgive others. And by the way, why would he? There's another thing we find. So there is no forgiveness for those who refuse to forgive others. But notice, and I'm not talking about hair salvation. I hope we understand. I'm talking about a relationship, uh, our walk with the Lord. We notice here, let's look, at, let's look back at verse 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king, which would take account of his servants. So we begin here with a king. So someone who is over and the servants, there's a many of them underneath. So one king, many servants underneath the king. Uh, down in verse 26, the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him saying, Lord. So he called this king, Lord, capital L there, not little L, capital L, have patience with me and I will repay thee all. Verse 28, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. Verse 29. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Here's what we learn. The refusal to forgive is rooted in the pride of a man who thinks himself to be better than, his, than the Lord himself. Let me say that again. The refusal to forgive is rooted in the pride of a man who thinks himself to be better than the Lord himself. Now that's what we find here. The Lord forgave the servant. The Lord is above the servant. The servant then, he refuses to forgive the fellow servant. So what this servant that's been forgiven indeed is doing is he sees himself as greater than his Lord. What is that? Pride. Um, do you want to know why you do not forgive or do not let something go whether with regard to your husband or your wife? You don't want to know what it is? 
Your pride. My pride is preventing you from forgiving your spouse because this is what the Bible teaches because you think yourself to be better than God Himself. Would you think that that's a serious thing? I think that would be indeed a very serious thing. You see, the greater sin in this account is found in the one who refused to forgive after he himself had been forgiven. That's the message tonight. My dad gave me, and he didn't give me a bunch of advice, but this is one of the advice he told me. Son, ask for forgiveness and learn to forgive. Why? Because this is what he saw. You know, before I was married, I thought, well, everything's going to go wonderful and Peachy is going to be wonderful. We love each other. All we need is love. You don't anticipate the sin. That's going to be part of that relationship. And so what is necessary in that relationship is what? Forgive. Now I know what happens. Pastor, you don't understand. No, 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 no. I do understand. I do. But what we do need to understand is we have to go back to the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Let me remind you of where we started. Colossians 3.12 Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, even as Christ forgave you. Ephesians 4.32 Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God. What keeps us from forgiving? Well, pastor, my wife, my husband, they did, they did wrong and they did not ask to be forgiven. And so we know that in order to forgive, someone has to ask for forgiveness. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Jesus Christ, without anybody asking, Look down upon those who berated him, who slapped him, who pierced him, who mocked him, who cast lots on him, who slapped him, who spat on him. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Nobody asked for forgiveness. But he forgave them anyways. You see, one of the greatest things that is lacking in marriage often is forgiveness. Someone may come and say, here, pastor, here is the list of the offenses. And the truth is, a pastor or a counselor cannot erase the offenses. But the counsel that is always faithful, according to the Word of God, is where someone has to learn to forgive. Because the truth is, the offenses cannot be erased. They cannot be reversed. And there's really often no amount of goodwill of the person to try to restore and to bring back a, a good relationship. But there has to be a point when someone says, I forgive you. Or even someone that may not say, it may be someone has offended you and you say, well, uh, they, they don't want to be forgiven. Forgive them anyway. Forgive them. If we don't forgive, then we are making ourselves greater than Christ. So may the Lord help us to have the mind of Christ on the matter of forgiveness.